大家好，呃，我是这场主持人 G D。那我们接下来的这个场次呢，邀请到日本这个 F S I S E C， 就是财经资讯情报交换中心的 C T O， 还有执行主任。来，我们介绍这个日本银行的状况。那 k a s k a k a m a t a s a n 它是有非常丰富的日本金融界的资讯经验，有十七年的这个经验，包含 JP s e r v e r CC 这个应事件应变中心，还有后来他是草创这个日本情资金融情资交换中心的这个创始成员。所以接下来呢，他会我们分享包含从这个银行遇到的治安挑战。这个钓鱼的事件，那要怎么交换使用情资来对付这样的事件？所以，让我们用这个是一样是现场是录影，但是讲者在线上，所以等一下有问题的话，请大家到议程表上的 slide 提问，那我们讲者会现场回答。所以，让我们用热烈的掌声欢迎这个 c o m p a 上的精彩议程，谢谢。Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for today's session. So uh, my name is Kei Kamata from uh, Financial Asia Japan, and I'm going to talk about uh, cybersecurity operation management, as a view from Japanese financial industry experience. So first of all, uh, introduce myself. Uh, my history: I was playing a lot of games during my teenage days. Uh, like going the arcade game center every day basis and play the team hours per day or uh, something like that. And then uh, during uh, the university days, I was uh, working for IT developers and operators for three years, and I understand the technical operations of the IT and uh, some sort of the security matters. So then, after in 2002, I started work for cybersecurity. Uh, now around 20 years in cybersecurity, and after that, I started work for one of Japanese mega bank called MUFG Bank for three years. Then uh, in 2014, I worked for established the financial Daisaku Japan, that is uh, information sharing and collaboration organization for Japanese financial industry. Then the, I also start establish Almoris in 2019. That is a cybersecurity education company. So currently, I mainly work for Financial Isaac Japan, and also I'm advisor to Financial Services Agency of Japanese Government. That is Japanese financial regulator, and uh, I do several other things. And finally, I, my hobby is uh, cycling. Uh, that is my major part of my working time. So today's agenda is like uh, uh, some small introduction, some case studies from Japanese financial industry, cyber security issues, and then several lessons around and conclusion. So introduction. So uh, when we talk about the Japanese financial industry, cyber security, I always explain that there are three different roles. So first one is uh, there are regulator policy layer that is mostly done by government or public sector. So the second one is uh, associations take the guidelines and third one is operation. So first one is we have like financial services agency as a regulator and the Bank of Japan for the regulator and central bank and they regulate uh, Japanese banks. And also we have the NISC, uh, that is uh, National Cyber Security Center. Uh, we have these three uh, public sector organizations as uh, making, they make the regulations, policies, laws, those things. And for the guideline part, we have the several, uh, many different associations, uh, bank associations, credit card associations, uh, insurance associations, and also we have the organization named the FISC, F-I-S-C, that is organization focusing on the creating guidelines for computer systems. So but, uh, the, the, this guideline creating organizations uh, consider more like a, a mid-term lens. They don't do the daily operations for cybersecurity uh, issues. So the financial data, Financial Isaac Japan is taking care of more like everyday basis 
uh, incident like phishing or fraud money transfers, DDoS attack. So with, if there's anything happens today, we discuss today and we do something today. So that kind of the operational viewpoint, we financial like Japan is taking care of the important role of the Japanese financial cybersecurity issues. So within, in Japan, historically, we have a concept. I think uh, many of you understand Chinese characters, so I uh, made it the slide with Chinese characters. So in Japan, we call it Jijo, Kyojo, Kojo. That means uh, self-help and mutual help and public help. So the, the, in Japanese, there is some Japanese history that's uh, if there's any problem in the like a nationwide thing. So we sh many of the people expect the government, the public entities will help everything for the everyone. But actually the government or public entities also don't have the enough resource to do everything. So uh, in the Japanese history, sometimes government ask the please consider to help by yourself first. Then if you don't have enough resource to do everything by yourself, please consider to helping each other in the neighborhood. So we call it Kyojo and uh, that we, maybe in English we can say mutual help. So within, if we think about the Japanese financial industry, we can uh, create some mutual help organization or activities uh, to to make our Japanese financial industry cyber security better. So uh, let's say that there's no single bank, one bank can do everything for the industry. So we need to think about uh, uh, several different banks, insurance companies, securities companies, helping each other to do uh, cyber security matters for industry wide. So that, that is a background of what why we established Financial Dialogue Japan and then uh, we work for uh, various cybersecurity matters and helping each other to uh, like creating tools and doing the project together, uh, doing the exercise together or uh, create maybe training materials and conduct hands-on exercise, something like that. So next, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Japanese cyber threat landscape in financial industry. So we have many various different cyber attacks happened in uh, financial industry. So initially, we say that uh, there are sophisticated uh, cyber attacks to cryptocurrency industry that I don't talk much about this today, but uh, we, we see various cases that the cryptocurrency companies are facing with a very sophisticated the APT like attack that is very highly technically, highly motivated, and very difficult to detect or protect. And then the, this is one of the important things we should consider. And then the next part, next one is a fraud money transfer, mainly target for the bank or payment companies, securities companies, insurance companies. So before, maybe like 10 years ago, five years ago, we see the fraud money transfer goes only for bank. But uh, uh, after we see the <clears throat> more and more payment companies are starting the services, we see the criminals targeting the payment companies to do fraud money transfer. And in these two or three years, we see more securities companies or insurance companies are becoming a target of the fraud money transfer. So I will explain some more details about this one later. And also we see the various cases that uh, business or service suspension by DDoS attack or other uh, crowd service trouble or maybe other hardware issues. But uh, many people believe the uh, cyber security is only about cyber attack. But uh, uh, we should think about uh, what is a business. Uh, we should think about the business viewpoint. So if the business or service suspended by some reason, it, it is not a matter of if it's cyber attack or not. So the, we see various cases that the business or internet service suspended 
because of the sometimes like we see DDoS attack, sometimes we see hardware trouble, sometimes we see misconfiguration, sometimes we see the, some the uh, routing routing issues. So then there are many different reasons to cause the business or service suspension. Sometimes we see the ransomware attack cause the business suspension or service suspension. Uh, but from the business viewpoint, uh, the reason like a cyber attack or not is not uh, super important, that, uh, but uh, we see the many uh, IT related cases that happen that causes the business or service suspension. Also, the, the uh, as I think that this is worldwide issues, but the information leakage through cloud services uh, in many of most of the cases, it is happened because of the uh, misconfiguration, the maybe system administrator or system integrator operators, they somehow misconfigure the cloud services and somehow uh, publish the data. And then someone finds, oh, your data is published and they notify to you. And then, they, then you realize your information is leaked. So those kind of the information leakage through cloud services by misconfiguration happens uh, a lot in Japan and worldwide, so that is uh, one of the uh, one of the issues we should focus. So the ransomware incident is uh, now becoming the problem worldwide. But I recognize uh, some some countries faces a lot of the ransomware incident, but uh, some other countries don't see the ransomware incident. So it looks like the Ransomware threat actors are targeting some some companies that can pay the fee of the ransom. So some I see the I see that the criminals activities are active in some countries, but not active in some other countries. And in Japanese financial industry, we don't see a lot of the ransomware incidents so far. That is uh, good for us, uh, but we have several small, several cases that I can introduce. I will uh, introduce some later. So now I, intro I introduce some case studies. So talking about the phishing, as you know, the attackers uh, established a phishing site for bank or maybe Sometimes we see the payment companies that uh, there is different phishing sites uh, established everyday basis. And then the, most of the cases, they try to steal the information like ID, ID and password, some personal information, but their uh, motivation is to not only to steal the personal information, but they try to get money uh, by phishing attack. And the bank, uh, Bank or payment companies were main target maybe like five years ago, but we see uh, securities or insurance companies are becoming more target these days. So that is one of the big difference uh, for now. And I, I would like to introduce several phishing site analysis in Japanese financial industry. And we see... <clears throat> Uh, more than 10,000 cases, sometimes it's like 7,000, sometimes it's like 15,000, so the numbers are different. Uh, but we see more than 10,000 phishing sites observed per month. And uh, most of the phishing sites are mobile companies, large bank, credit card companies. And uh, those uh, top three target is like 80% of those uh, 10,000. And uh, so phishing site, phishing site usually have their own domain names. And then the, 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 when we analyze the domain registration companies, uh, we see the DuckDNS, Webnik, uh, Namesail, GoDaddy's are mainly used uh, to register the domain name. And the important thing is those uh, registration companies are not major majorly used in Japan. So I, we, we think that that is... Uh, there's another entities outside of Japan uh, doing these activities. And also, the, if we think about uh, what hosting companies are used, uh, we see the 80%, four, only four hosting companies are used, 80% of those phishing sites. So there are some trends that uh, attackers are choosing some specific hosting 
companies uh, to do to establish the fishing site. And then the, we see the top level domains, uh, uh, major major domains use top level domains are uh, org, org, com, cn, top, xyz. And we don't see a lot of the cases of the .jp domains used for uh, fishing site. I think that is because uh, .jp is a, a kind of expensive compared to other domain names. And I think that they choose uh, easier domain name or cheaper domain name for a phishing site. And uh, most of uh, the interesting thing is that most of the phishing site is using HTTPS. And uh, actually, there are some cases that, for example, some Japanese government website is not using HTTPS, but the phishing site is using HTTPS. Uh, maybe it's like uh, 15 years ago, the people said, uh fishing site never use https so we should uh we can determine if the their website or fishing site by checking the https or not but uh, recently the fishing site is almost all all of them are using https by let's encrypt and then there are some cases a real site is not using the https uh, so the so now the fishing site are more secure, uh, if we say uh, so. And then the we we see that they they take effort to create the HTTPS site for uh, fishing site. And then also uh, as I as I told you that we see the uh, many of the fishing site were targeting the mobile companies. So there are three major. Uh, Japanese mobile companies are NTT, Docomo, AU, KDDI, and then SoftBank. Those three companies are major Japanese uh, mobile operators. And then we, we see a lot of the phishing sites are targeting those mobile operators. That is because uh, uh, I think that mobile companies have a crazy large number of the customer volumes. It's like uh, uh, 40 million users. Uh, potentially uh, run in Japan or something like that. So uh, maybe 40 million customers is like one of the largest Japanese bank volume. So I think that it is good cost performance things to target the mobile companies. And then also the almost all of those mobile companies have uh, their own payment services that uh, if the attackers can steal some information from users, they can easily steal money by those through the, those mobile payment services. And also, the we see the rise of the using the eSIM. eSIM is easier to uh, start service or create some contract. Then we don't need to go to the physical shop to start services. And maybe the eSIM or mobile payment services, they do many things online. And then the attackers can easily to steal money by those uh, online services. And that, that is the reason why uh, I think the mobile companies are becoming target. So another uh, phishing site analysis, and uh, uh, we see the, some cases that the attackers create uh, like thousands of the URL for single phishing site. So they use a dynamic DNS services by duck DNS and create like hundreds of the URL and then they distribute the uh, URLs for many people. And then, but if we go to the phishing site, the, all of those different URL phishing sites are using the same IP addresses, IP address. And then the, we see what we see is as you can see on my screen. Uh, so if when you receive some SMS, the uh, the link is like using bit.ly, ly, and then if you click it, they, that goes to dynamic DNS URL, and then dynamic DNS URL go to the phishing site that uh, all are same IP addresses. So that is one of the case we see the attackers are using a lot of the dynamic DNS. So there's another case that if you when you receive some phishing email and then the, you go to phishing site, they ask uh, ID and password. And then the, when you type ID and password, you see the login screen. 
And actually, you, even if you type the wrong ID and password, you can log in. So that is the interesting part of the phishing site. So you don't have to input the right information, but if you are uh, expecting to see what's inside, you can just type some strings, looks like email address and some stupid password. Then you can go log in and see they require to pay some money. So then the, in this case, they uh, in this screenshot, they require to pay 40,000 Japanese yen. And then they, you can, it looks like you can choose some 7 Eleven and the uh, Pagey and the uh, iTunes. It looks like you can choose, but actually, the, you can choose only the iTunes. Then the, you, you choose iTunes uh, gift cards, then go to the next page. And then they require to input the uh, uh, I turn serial code. Then the you can you can finish the payment. So in Japan, we see many cases that the uh, cyber criminals ask you to go to a convenience store and the buy iTunes gift card and the tell the serial number. So that so it looks like the iTunes gift card is considered one of the important thing for criminals. And then the, we, we, we see the phishing site is also using that kind of things. So this is another phishing site. If you go to phishing site, you type ID and password and log in. After you log in, you require to pay some money. And then the, the phishing site will ask you to go to ATM physically and then the uh, pay money by using the Peiji, that is Japanese uh, payment service that, that you can do it at the ATM. And then the Peiji, you 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 use Peiji to do the payment and, that, and you need to go to ATM and the phishing. So it's an interesting thing is a phishing site ask you to go to physical ATM physically and to do the operation. And then they provide a very detailed manual. So this screenshot is uh, uh the manual how to operate the atm and then the phishing site asks you to go to atm and uh, click this button uh type one two three and the uh, transfer like uh, twenty thousand japanese yen something like that so so that, that's so phishing site is not only the internet they ask you to go to atm to make a payment so also the we see a uh, phishing site for life insurance companies and then that is kind of a new trend and but uh, within some ins life insurance companies uh, as criminals can steal money once if they get the personal information and then the so because the many of the people believe that this kind of phishing site happens only bank uh, in financial industry, but so uh, when the phishing site happens in life insurance companies, life insurance company people did not uh, have experience to handle phishing site. So the, we discussed, we create some uh, meeting to discuss about how we respond to it and then bank people provide the knowledge and experience to uh, life insurance companies and also we see the some uh, cyber criminals are contact to customer support chat and ask uh, what to do so what we see is uh, uh, so customer support chat is saying thank you for waiting then the the customer and this is actually the criminal is saying that I cannot access to my service as a bank account. Then the customer support said we detect suspicious behavior, and then your account has suspended. So how I can recover my account? So then the support says we need to identify identity information like our name, birth date, address, phone number, or etc. And then the uh, criminals actually have those basic personal information uh, through phishing site, so they, they can uh, they can tell the exact right information to unlock the unlock the account. So then they they steal money and then they go somewhere. So that happens. So those are several cases I introduced uh, phishing site and. Uh, I 
<clears throat> I introduced some ransomware incident happens in Japanese uh, securities companies. So in some securities companies, they have the online trade service running through the internet. So, and then uh, for maintaining this system, they had some uh, computers uh, using uh, that that was wrongly open the remote desktop protocol of the Windows RDP, and then attackers somehow find this RDP and get log in, uh, get into the online trade service and do the ransomware uh, incident. So this happens uh, because mainly because uh, this security company initially they did not uh, intend to use the internet to provide service, um, but uh, they changed their mind to use the internet. And then uh, they connect the system to the internet and then uh, they change the network configuration and then they wrongly open the RDP uh, without the proper access control. And then they didn't intend to op uh, intend to op uh, use RDP, even use RDP, but uh, they, uh, they, they their uh, operation misconfigured to uh, open the RDP and the attacker use it to the uh, ransomware. So in, in this case, the securities companies could not recover the, all the system. They had data as backup, but they could not recover the system itself, and they uh, renewed the system after this incident. But uh, this incident happens uh, because they did not recognize RDP open, it's misconfigured, and also initially they did not think about using the internet for this service, but they changed after years. So that, that kind of the uh, like the the difference of they change the network diagram later and also they miss wrongly uh, turn on the RDP. So those kind of the misconfiguration operation causes uh, somewhere incident. So this kind of the misconfiguration things always happens and uh, sometimes we see uh, this kind of the things uh, causes a very serious uh, cyber attack incident. So, the, so the, 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 this is the third cases I'd like to introduce to you under cloud service access control. There were cloud service, uh, I say service S, and then the, this service company notified the users there will be configuration change happens maybe in three months or something like that. And the most of because uh, this configuration change uh, looks very complicated, many of the customers did not understand what it is. And then uh, they tried to understand, but uh, they couldn't understand that uh, they didn't take any action. And then the, this configuration change happens, and the, many of the financial institutions' data suddenly become public because of this change. So this is also happens, uh, many of the people recognize this is happens because of the misconfiguration, uh, but the, the, the some of the users say that the, this announcement, the notice of the configuration change is uh, too complicated to understand. And then the two for understanding this configuration change, uh, these companies, the customers, need to have the uh, very strong expert who un completely understand this cloud service. But uh, most many of the financial institutions didn't have th that kind of the expert in the company, and then <clears throat> they could not understand that this happens. So th there are many discussions. What is a problem? Uh, but I will introduce later. Uh, but uh, this cloud service company says, oh, we announced that, so it is your fault. And then the customer side said, no, your announce was not enough. So it's like uh, there is a big argument between the cloud service vendor and customers. So this is the case. So what do we do for it? And uh, so three cases I introduced, the phishing, uh, somewhere under growth service case and uh, for the phishing case we uh, because uh, we see too much number of the phishing site launches uh, every day basis and uh, we create some small technical group uh, to develop and distribute phishing site detection tool so 
uh, we, we use uh, open open source information, OSINT, open source intelligence capabilities to gather the information of the phishing site uh, URLs. And so you and the FISAC Japan members can search if there is any of the phishing site is available for the company, for bank. And then we distribute the tool to all the members and uh, we also provide the hands-on training uh, for in-house monitoring of the phishing site. Also, we create the Tor node servers list for monitor suspicious IP addresses for the banks, and uh, that is a kind of effective way to monitor uh, some suspicious access to the internet banking system or internet insurance management system uh, from the suspicious IP addresses. And then the so larger as as maybe the large banks or larger financial institutions have enough resource to monitor the phishing site everyday basis, but the smaller banks, the smaller institutions, smaller insurance companies don't have enough resource to monitor the phishing site everyday basis. So we do the create some information sharing community, phishing site share information sharing community, and uh, they, when we detect some uh, phishing site, we exchange the information among the members and then the oh you about you oh mr x from bank a you have phishing site today did you aware of that and we can tell that and if the bank a person uh it is new for him to handle the phishing site we the some of the community member teach him how to handle the phishing site so that was kind of the helping each other things happens uh, a lot for phishing site activities for the ransomware incident uh, in the beginning of my presentation i introduced uh, we don't see many ransomware cases uh, at the industries uh, but we see uh, ransomware cases some sometimes and uh, basically we don't see it is very critically high seriously uh, impact thing but we keep gathering the global trend of the ransomware uh, incident and what we discuss more about ransomware is uh, more business viewpoint uh, agendas like uh, uh, if we get ransomware incident how we consider to pay or not so most of the people believe most of the people said we never pay for it but there are some cases especially in the colonial pipeline case in the united states they pay initially pay and they take back some money by fbi operation so there is option of paying if the uh, the victim company is very important critical infrastructure companies. So, so even even some global uh, discussions, uh, people want to leave the possibility of the paying to ransomware to recover the data. So, so that kind of the business uh, decision making discussion is running, and also the an another thing is if we get the ransomware incident. In many cases, we our business will be suspended. Our service will be suspended for three days, maybe one week or even one month or something. Mm -hmm. So how we do the BCP? So we discuss those things also. For the case of the cloud service access control, we uh, after that happens, we discussed what is happens and we discussed to create some guidelines how to respond to it and how to handle the cloud services access control things. So every time when we see some cases happen, we get together and discuss how to respond to it and what lesson, what are the lessons run and uh, what we should do for the next or future. So we do that. And then also we discussed with the cloud service provider and uh, what was problem. It's like post-mortem and then we see uh, uh, what we should have done uh, for this case, so for the future possibilities. And also we organized uh, some technical member, uh, technical seminar for members, uh, what was happened, what was the issue, who, who say what, and what is a real problem, uh, what we can do for the future. So that kind of seminars we organize and uh, share those information to all the members. So final conclusion. So do some PPT, people process technology analysis. 
Uh, so, as I told you, there are many different cases of the cyber security, cyber attack situation happens in Japanese financial industry. And then <clears throat> uh, the, the one of the important thing is the security team really understands current cyber threat situation in Japan or not or global. So, so we need to keep update ourselves for understanding the current situation. But uh, uh, if we work for some companies, our time goes to do some internal matters. But we need to see more outside of the company to understand the current situation. So if focusing on the people, people don't have time to look outside of the company, uh, but they need to understand the current situation. So that is uh, so sometimes uh, making a problem. So, and then the also uh, we the, then we organize seminar or hands-on training, the opportunities for the security people to learn and understand the current situations. And then the, sometimes we see the people don't have the enough knowledge or experience to understand the current situation. Maybe for understanding ransomware, they need to have some knowledge of the Windows operating system or software. Uh, or data backup, or even some BCP management, and those things. For so, we if we recognize that people don't have the enough knowledge or experience, we create some training material, uh, provide hands-on seminar, provide uh, some lecture, uh, or maybe tabletop exercise discussions or things. And so the for the people viewpoints. Uh, Having the good information source is uh, important things, and then the co belong to community, strong community, the active strong community is important to do that. And also, the even if you have the very good understanding of the cybersecurity from the technical viewpoint, management viewpoint, if you don't have the good corporate internal communications to others, to other than IT division or maybe board of members or maybe head of IT directors, uh, it, it is not uh, you are protecting the company. So the corporate internal communication uh, is another important part of thinking. And also the, we should recognize that people, uh, we do misconfiguration and the misconfiguration happens that causes uh, cyber incident and that cyber incident causes a uh, serious uh, business suspension for the company. From the process organization viewpoint, uh, creating the policy is not difficult, but the enforcement of the policy is much more difficult. And then the, in many of the cyber uh, victim cases, uh, things happen because we really did not understand what IT asset we have throughout companies, within including subsidiaries, maybe overseas, uh, something like that. And also the, we see many cases that uh, how strong IT division, security division matters, uh, how they have the strong cybersecurity issues. And also the recently, the, it, it is worldwide problem that the, the top level uh, corporate management understanding of the cyber risk is a key issue for now. And from the technically technology viewpoint, the small things cause big problem, uh, like uh, the ransomware RDP cases. That was a very small uh, misconfiguration, but called, that causes uh, corporate wide business suspension for uh, one month, two months. And then they needed to rebuild the, all of the services. So the, if we uh, skip some small technical things, that causes a very big impact for the business. We need to understand that. And also recently, uh, the, we have the more discussions about if we should do the in-house technical operation or we should outsource uh, to the vendors and the more, more and more uh, financial institutions uh, start thinking about the in-house technical operations, uh, not perfectly depending on the vendors. So we see more cases uh, in-house in-house technical operation team is running. And also the for the cybersecurity matters, uh, it is uh, daily operations, agile thinking is more important. And also the we. Even in the financial Japan, we have 427 members. We don't have uh, 
large number of the technical people the, who understand, who can do the hands-on real programming, who create the develop, who create tools or distribute tools. Uh, but uh, if one of them can develop the tool and distribute to them, uh, they can help others. So we should understand the technical people can help non-technical people. So then the, it is always we say that we need more people to work. And then the, uh, the if we think about the people, it is always I think about the technical skill or management skill. So technical skill is, of course, important to do the technical operation of cybersecurity matters. But we also need the management people to discuss with the corporate top management or maybe uh, outside of the IT division people or maybe talk to regulators. So both of the uh, technical and management skills are important, but there's no single person who understands both perfectly. So we need to help each other to share the resource. So then, the, as, as I told you, the talking to the top level management is more getting more important for making them understand how the cyber incidents affect to their business in the long term period. And then also the uh, even for talking to the top level management, uh, there are many challenges, uh, how to talk, what kind of words we should use, uh, what is more important for them. Also, for having the, even for having the better discussion with the top level management, so helping each other with in the industry uh, to like uh, maybe company A tells, or oh, I told uh, my uh, CIO about this information and he understand very well, please use this material. So that kind of the helping each other in the industry is really effective uh, for the better cybersecurity operations from even from the management viewpoint and technical viewpoint. And then the, that kind that can become a power uh, to have the better cybersecurity. So that is my conclusion. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I expect we have some time to get a question. Kamada-san, so for this uh, very fruitful talk, and um, um, I see currently there's no question from Slido yet. And uh, is there any question from anyone on site? OK, I, I have a question. So um, you are the establisher of the FISAC in Japan. So this is. Um, you share many like a phishing site and uh, this kind of information. How do you uh, share this information, distribute the indicators like IOC to the banks? And uh, how do you encourage the, the banks to share back the, the information to FISAC? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear? Yes, yes. Yeah. So we share various information, including IOC. And also, we sometimes share like a malware sample. Uh, we share the IP address of the attackers for the fraud money transfer. We share the various uh, methodologies, methodologies of how attackers try to steal money from banks. So we share uh, very much of the technical details, uh, like malware sample, IP addresses, domain names, hash value, those things, and also the how the attackers uh, trick the customers, right? sometimes they make a phone call to the bank customers and try to cheat them. And then we, we share those kind of the social engineering technique information. So we share the technical details also together with non-technical information. And uh, how, how do you encourage the members to share back the feedback of their, their some IOC, they suffer attack? How, how do you um, encourage them to share? Yeah, so it, it is always very difficult question how to encourage the members. But uh, if, uh, we, if uh, someone, sometimes someone asks me a question, uh, if they have some information or if they face some situation like attack or some incident or some uh, strange situation, they ask us, then the, we, I, I suggested them to share the information to the community and then you will get a better feedback than my experience, uh, than my explanation. So the, 
if they if they once experience the good uh, good good thing by sharing the member, they will keep doing that. So uh, anytime when some of the member have the situation, we suggest them to share the information to the community, and they will have the good experience. By other members will uh, actively. Uh, help them to solve the issues or handling the incident. So uh, many, many of the members hesitate to share the information to the community, but they want to talk to someone. So we encourage uh, each of them to share the information to the community, not only talk to the some specific people, then they will have the good experience and they will understand that it is a better way to share the information to the community. Thank you, thank you. Because uh, I also work for one of the largest Japanese bank, and I feel sometimes mm -hmm. I want to share some information, but the, the, maybe the upper management thing is too sensitive to share. So that's a, uh, we hesitate to show how much an uh, instance and how sensitive instance should we share feedback to this kind of ISAC. That's a, always a challenge. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you. And uh, any other questions? Okay, I, I have another a second question because I my my maybe my role in the company is very similar to your role, like fighting these fishing sites. Like uh, mm -hmm. how how do you like we we have difficulty to uh, take them down because um, usually the hosting vendor or the Cloud vendor, they don't collaborate with us, so it's difficult to take down phishing sites. Is there any uh, better way to to like uh, deal with uh, phishing sites? How to block them? Like in Taiwan, um, Taiwan police has a system to block phishing sites, starting from last year. So if there is a confirmed phishing site, and we can report to Taiwan police, and Taiwan police can request the ISP to stop resolving the DNS. So this is called a DNS uh, PRZ, the, the pre resolution broker. So um, police in Taiwan can request um, Taiwan SP to stop resolving some phishing domains. Is there any similar way to do that in Japan? Oh, yes, uh, in Japan, if we find some the difficult situation to handle uh, handle the incident only by financial industry. We talk to the other industries like ISPs or hosting companies. And sometimes we talk to the national uh, SAT team, the JP SAT coordination center, or sometimes we talk to the government agencies for asking them, them to help contact the uh, hosting companies or maybe the owner of the IP address or owner of the phishing site or something like that. So we always try to expand our network to talk uh, handling the incident, both of the locally in Japan and also globally international. So sometimes if we need to contact to some international financial institutions, we talk to the international friends to find the point of contact to help us, or sometimes we set up like a meeting or conference to talk to them or asking them to help to solve the issues. So uh, if there's anything we cannot solve by ourselves, we always ask to help, like uh, even if, we, if it's police agencies or Japanese government agencies, or maybe cybersecurity companies, vendors, or anything like that. Thank you very much. Yes. I think uh, Thank you. the Taiwan and the Japan all suffer many similar criminal case um, because mm -hmm. maybe the same criminal actor want to attack a bank in Taiwan and Japan both, like yeah. um, uh, the same actors behind, so we can collaborate uh, more in the future. So thank you very much for joining uh, this conference and sharing. Thank you very much. So, I um, hope to visit Taiwan next time. Yeah, we really hope you can be in person with us next time. And since there's no other questions on site and I didn't see on Slido, so maybe that's all for um, this sharing. And let's uh, give our big hands again for Kamada-san for sharing uh, this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Kamada-san. Thank you very much, everyone.